It's great to see all of you again. I'm very pleased to welcome you back to the Meet the Instruments class. Uh, as you know, this term we're spotlighting the instruments and the brass and percussion families. And today we're focusing on the tuba and euphonium. Our presenter today is Dr. Danielle Van Tunenen, and she joined the School of Music faculty at UF in August 2019 as assistant professor of tuba and euphonium. Danielle earned a Bachelor of Music degree from Central Michigan University and Master of Music and Doctor of Musical Arts degrees in performance from Arizona State University, which has a great music school. Dr. Van Tunenen has performed with several ensembles throughout Arizona, Michigan, and in the New England areas, including the Grand Rapids Symphony and the New England Brass Band. Danielle is also the co-founder of the Moreau Van Tunenen Duo, which is performed throughout the United States and Europe, and I hope she tells us something about this ensemble today. In addition, she's been invited to perform at the International Alliance for Women in Music, the International Tuba Euphonium Conference, and the Spanish Association of Tubas and Euphonium. As a strong proponent of new music, Danielle has been coordinator of several commissioning projects for both solo tuba and solo euphonium and percussion and euphonium repertoire. Her leadership has resulted in over 15 new works. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Danielle Van Tudernan. Welcome, Danielle. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to, to get to talk to you guys. This does happen to be my favorite subject to talk about. <laughs> so. Uh, an hour is just not enough time. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about the Moreau Van Tynan duo. It's actually a duo that we founded when I was in grad school. Uh, it's for percussion, tuba, and euphonium. And we premiere new works for the ensemble and for that instrumentation all over the world. Uh, our goal is to always, is to, um, empower younger composers so that they get more outlets to, to have their music performed. Um, and it actually, it, it's funny because that duo came out of a class assignment when I was in grad school. You know, we had to do something that hadn't been done before and there, was, there wasn't much of that going on. So I, we decided to create the class or to create the ensemble. Uh, today I have a, a slide presentation for you guys along with some actual demonstration here. Like I was saying before uh, most of you came on to the call, I, uh, I wish you could see behind me because it's just full of, of different versions of tubas and euphoniums that I'm, I'm going to share with you today. Um, I will have a lot of sound clips and uh, I will hope to have it all done in the time frame. <laughs> that being said, I will send my presentation. I'll send it over to you, Don, once I'm done, so that if anybody would like to see it afterwards, they're more than welcome. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. One second. Hold on one moment. All right, here we go. All right, so can everybody see this yep. presentation? Perfect. Yes. Oh, I forgot to hit my sound. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many things. All right, there we go. So the tuba family, as my colleagues have already talked about, they, they probably said that their instrument is the best by far. And I happen to disagree with them. <laughs> the tuba family contains the lowest instruments within the brass family. That being said, it's also the youngest members of the brass family. Uh, all of these instruments, somebody asked a question right at the beginning on how to change pitch and how do you know you're changing pitch with these instruments. Now, my general, my golden rule is if you can whistle, then you can change pitch on a brass instrument. So it's a combination 
Uh, any of these brass instruments is a combination of essentially giving a raspberry with the front portion of your lip and angling the back of your tongue. So if you were to whistle, the back of the tongue does a lot of anchoring up and down. And so when we add a little buzz to the front, and I angle my tongue, that's essentially what we're doing in order to get different pitches out of, out of these instruments. Because uh, we are quite limited. The tubas, on, on the other hand, do have more valves than any of its other brass counterparts. Uh, as you see in this picture here, this one, this tuba in particular has four valves, but we can have as many as seven valves um, in different uh, figurations, either five up front, four paddles plus one on the thumb, and then two over on the left hand side. A combination of two on one side, three on one on the other, and reverse. It's it's quite, you know, tubas are tend to be the most diverse when it comes to the way that they're built as well as the way that they look. So let's dig into the heavy metal member of our brass family, the tuba. Uh, but first, we have to start back in time. We are going to go back to the, sixth, uh, to the 16th century where the predecessor of the tuba and the euphonium started called the serpent. The serpent, the, the, the name or the, the definition of the serpent is, is quite literally the snake. And this was created so that those that were singing in, uh, in church would have some sort of foundation. So it matched the ma a, a male voice while people were singing in a more Gregorian chant-like uh, fashion. So it was created in 1590 by a French instrument maker. He was also, he, it, it said that this particular instrument maker actually came up with this design by accident because he was he wanted something to support his his uh, musicians uh, and he came up with this now let me grab mine for you it's not the most ergonomic instrument as you can see it is, it is quite long now if i were to stretch this completely out it would be eight feet in length um so in order to make it more playable, they've curved it around. And throughout history, you'll see different configurations of this instrument. Uh, you'll see it sometimes played like this, where the, the performer will kind of anchor it off to the left, or you'll see it propped right in between your legs or draped off of uh, where one of your legs is going through this bottom bow here. Um, it was entirely used for to be played alongside vocal music. Now, that being said, when the serpent became more well known, composers like Berlioz took advantage of this. Now, I'm not going to get into what it sounds like uh, with Berlioz until the next instrument, but just keep in mind that this instrument is still played actively today, especially over in Europe. Um, it is now being sought after as a more improvis improvisatory slash jazz instrument, which is silly to think about a 16th century instrument being utilized for jazz, which I just think is absolutely fantastic. Um, the cool thing about this instrument, and let me demonstrate, if I were to, if I had a lower voice, you would be able to hear that the quality of the sound mimics that of either a low female voice or a mid male voice. So this instrument is unlike the valved instruments of the tuba and euphonium. This one has six holes and you can't see it on mine necessarily too well because it's so dark, but in the picture there are six holes and the fingers have to close those holes off. But if you look at my left hand, it is not in the most comfortable positioning and it's mirrored by the right hand, which is in an equally as uncomfortable hand position. So through time, they actually created keys that would go over top of them, thus allowing for more holes to be put in. 
and for more pitch and note accuracy. Because if you hear, there's a lot of wavering. And I'm not doing anything with my fingers. That was just my lip bending those pitches up and down. Um, so this is kind of where we started with, these, with this instrument. Now, I want to share with you a lovely sound recording, or actually it's a video, and we're just going to listen to a little bit of it, of one of my all-time friends and favorite serpent players. Hold on one second. Ah. Okay. So this is Patrick Weibart, and he is a French euphonium serpent and sex horn player. Um, and this is an early rendition of Michael Koretz, Sonata Number no. One. And I'm gonna, I'll play a few minutes of it. The the serpent is quite virtuosic once you get past the hand position and the need for uh, accuracy when it comes to your embouchure, which is the sound that you're making with your lips. So here we go. Can you guys hear that? Yes. Okay. idea of how this instrument kind of developed from from the the characteristics of the human voice I mean it's almost like he was singing through his instrument and just kind of guiding the notes with his fingers which is which is really remarkable uh, this actually happens to be my one of my favorite instruments is the serpent um, so you wouldn't think this to be the case, but at the time, the serpent was technically the base, the base voice for the cornet family, which or bugle family, which were unvalved, non-valved non brass instruments. Uh, so it was utilized in military bands, and it was. It's funny because you'll see these pictures of people walking around with serpents. And uh, from someone who plays serpent, I cannot even imagine how tired their hands would be from trying to grasp the, the, uh, the holes. Um, so on to what these instruments are made of. This modern day serpent is actually a carbon fiber copy of an instrument that was made in France. Um, this will allow the instrument to not warp uh, because earlier models of this instrument were actually oftentimes made out of wood or uh, packed leather. So it would be layers upon layers of leather that were then, that were then compressed to thicken. Um, so with weather changes or with water, these instruments would shrink and expand, ultimately changing the pitch of the instrument. So they, they then started making them entirely out of wood and covering them in leather so that they would stay more within a certain shape. Um, but they, they, did, they did kind of suffer from uh, weather changes even after the change to entirely wood. Now, like, have you guys had bassoon in yet or the uh, oboes? No? So, like bassoon, the serpent actually has this vocal that if I take it out, it's a metal bend that allows for an easier playing position and connects the mouthpiece. 
Um, now my each vocal is a different size, allowing for the pitch of the instrument to change. So mine is actually allowing for the instrument to be pitched in B flat, uh, which is similar to modern day euphoniums. And the mouthpiece here, my particular mouthpiece, it's shaped similarly to a trombone mouthpiece, which I, I know you had in, uh, just recently. Uh, but m this mouthpiece here is either made out of wood or ivory. This one happens to be wood, um, and it's, again, it is subject to the temperature change, which is silly because it's been cold out, so my mouthpiece is now wicked loose, and it just kind of slips right out. Um, but that's kind of the, the overall take on that instrument. Um, like I mentioned before, it is highly dependent on the proficiency of the player. Um, as you can imagine, when, when we, the early representation of these instruments, uh, the instruments weren't moving around too much because they were just creating a solid baseline for the vocal performance performers. So they didn't need to be as virtuosic as they, the need is, is now. Now, I did mention, if I stretch this out, it is eight feet in length, and that is the same for the tenor trombone, as well as the euphonium. Um, so that's kind of where we started with the, with, uh, the tuba euphonium family, is with the serpent and the eight feet of tubing, it has become the standard for where our family of instruments lie. Here are some examples of the serpent. So like I mentioned before, keys were then added. So if you see the, the image on the far left that it is wood and it's covered in leather, and you'll have all these different keys allowing for um, more versatility throughout the instrument, but also uh, an ease of reaching the keys themselves. And in this case, it looks like the the musician decided to go with a metal mouthpiece, which is common today to, to have metal mouthpieces. Now, the really cool one over on the far right, so that is also a serpent, the far right, uh, the top right hand corner. Uh, these instruments, so if you look at a lot of paintings from the medieval time uh, well into the 16th century, the serpent will, would have been painted in these paintings, and oftentimes they would actually have, as you can see here, a serpent face and scales or fish fins um, because the serpent was known to be more uh, of a demonic nature in sound when it was originally being played. So uh, because the materials weren't so the uh, as high of a quality as they needed to be, the instruments of the time really sounded kind of crotchety and and kind of uh, more guttural than they do now. Um, so it's it's kind of cool to see where they came from and and kind of how they wanted to showcase them. Now the one on the bottom right, the bottom right hand corner, is a member of the serpent family called the anaconda. <laughs> and, <laughs> and believe it or not, there's a ridiculously small serpent called the worm. And of course, they are it, the names are all just based on the size. Uh, and there's a there is a serpent that is larger than the anaconda, and you actually have to stand up on a chair to play it. Um, of course, you need uh, paddles in order to play it because it's so large. But I, I thought that was a nice little addition down there. Uh, tuba players in general have a, a silly sense of humor, and I'm glad to see that even our, um, you know, our ancestors didn't get away from that. So, <laughs> uh, on to the next member of the family. Sadly, I don't own one of these instruments. Um, it is a dream of mine to own one. But the serpent evolved into what this instrument, this instrument is called the ophiclide. And it essentially translates to keyed serpent. Now, this instrument is entirely made of metal. It actually kind of resembles a modern day saxophone, but with a brass mouthpiece on it. And oddly enough, 
that Adolf Sax, who created the saxophone, had a, a tie-in with the maker of the Ophiclyde. So the Ophiclyde did come around in the 19th century, in 1817. It didn't last that long because the tuba and sax horn came about 20 years later. So it wasn't, it didn't have as long of a run, but it is still, prime, it is still played today in Europe. Um, it ultimately replaced exactly what the serpent was doing. So you would see pictures, not so much documentation, but you'll see pictures of Alpha Clydes in church services or military bands. Um, these instruments had uh, nine keys with paddles and would get up to as, as many as 12. So you would have the full chromatic line of 12 notes in order to play whatever note you wanted to. And it just has, I personally think it has an absolutely brilliant sound um, when played well, of course. Um, as you can see in this picture, I just grabbed this, this cute little drawing. Um, right, it actually has a vocal as well that changes the overall pitch of the instrument. Um, they, they range in various keys, as do the tubas. Um, and as did the serpent, it just wasn't as well documented. Uh, here is an example of the Ophiclyde. Whoops, did not mean to click that. Let me go here. Here's the example of Ophiclyde. Um, oh, looks like we're going to have... We've built more than into pro... Okay. Time. We had now. Save money. <laughs> so... This is also Patrick Weibart. So he plays Ophiclyde and Serpent. Um, he studied at the Paris Conservatory. Um, and he, I, I have a feeling you're absolutely going to just love the sound of this instrument. It sounds a lot like a piano, doesn't it? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I'm just kidding. snippet of the Ophiclyde. Now I, the, the main goal when transitioning from the serpent to the Ophiclyde was to allow for greater control, as you can hear in, in this recording, um, and better flexibility when it comes to shifting between registers of the instrument. So it, it really allows the performer to dance around the instrument and if you're familiar with euphonium now, uh, which I will get to later, but if you're if you're familiar with the instrument already, um, there's a there's a similarity between these two because the euphonium within the brass world is known to be extremely virtuosic, and it the the parent to the euphonium is the ophiclyde is a direct descendant from from the ophiclyde, so it. Uh, they, the makers kind of continued that line of um, 
really allowing for the uh, the progression of the the instrument itself. Okay, so next. So the Offaclyde family, each as you're going to notice, you know no, these instruments get a little lonely, and they all need a little family to go along with it. So. Each member of the tuba family, so serpent, ophiclide, tuba, saxhorn, euphonium, each one has a huge array of instruments within that, the, that subgroup. Um, the ophiclide, in this case, does have four basic members of the ophiclide family, and that is soprano, alto, bass, and contrabass. Now, somebody can argue that the, the bass ophiclide tends to be the most uh, centralized around the modern day euphonium or tuba. The soprano, alto, and count, uh, contrabass ophiclides are the more um, kind of, they're more rare, they're more uh, a unique sound, so you, they didn't really stick around as much. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, the, the ophiclide has initially had three more keys than the serpent, uh, though with the invention of paddle, uh, large paddle um, like valve covers, uh, they were able to extend that to 12, allowing for more notes to be played. And just like, let me grab my mouthpiece here, the closest one. Just like the uh, serpent, the ophiclide had a similar mouthpiece, though it was entirely made out of metal. Now, the, as you'll notice, the larger we get with the instruments, of course, the mouthpieces will be larger, but they'll also go from being a more cone-like to more cup-like. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Dr. Robertson mentioned this when he was talking about trombone, but the trombones, given the shape of their instrument, they tend to play with a little more of a V-cup mouthpiece, as opposed to us, we tend to play with a more uh, actual cup-like mouthpiece. And that just allows for the sound to be, have more cushion, have more depth underneath, and that starts here with the ophiclide. That's what gives it that, that distinct warm sound, and with a little shimmer on top. Um, so eventually the ophiclide does die out. Now, that being said, it is still heavily played today over in Europe, but it does transition off to the tuba and euphonium, and you'll start seeing that with the music that's being written for them. Um, now I did mention that the ophiclide was a, a ancestor to the euphonium. However, there is evidence that it, the saxophone is also a descendant of the sax horn. So I, I thought this was so neat. When I was looking up, I was, I was typing up these, um, these slides and I was like, oh my gosh, I just found this awesome fact. So Adolf Sax, he was an instrument maker around the same time and he was repairing an old sax horn ended up putting a woodwind mouthpiece in it. Now, I don't know what exactly that meant because I don't, I'm not familiar with what the woodwind mouthpieces looked like at the time, but he put a mouthpiece in it and all of a sudden he got this brilliant idea of an, another instrument to, to, to create. Thus begins the process of the modern saxophone design. So you'll often hear people say that the euphonium and the sax horn are really closely related, and that's why the, same, the maker of the saxophone actually had a direct tie with the euphonium, and that's actually what a lot of times you'll actually hear euphoniums and sax, uh, saxophones playing together, and they sound like one. It's, it's quite remarkable that a woodwind instrument and a brass instrument can be so similar. Okay. So, I wanted to give you some, a listening sample of the serpent and the ophiclide together. Now, I could not, for the life of me, find a, a modern take on Midsummer Night's Dream with 
uh, original instruments, however, Symphony Fantastique, Berlioz with the DSC array, you're, you're going to get to hear the guttural, crunchy sound of the serpent and the ophicleide together. And this is how Berlioz had intended the, that really kind of eerie section of the piece to sound. Um, originally, the piece was to be played with one serpent and one ophicleide. And now in today's orchestra, it is it is has been uh, replaced by two tubas, most of the time two bass tubas, which is which are the smaller tubas. Um, but this is how he originally had intended the entire piece to sound, and I, I really hope you like this. We are going to listen to the whole thing because it's just that good. Thank you. So that, that crunchy sound in combination with the bassoons and the contrabassoons is exactly where our, these instruments are meant to fit in. And, and even in today's modern concert band, you'll hear that instrument pairing quite often. Um, it's, it, it just gives it that the serpent off of Clyde just give the bassoons of that time a uh, sense of roundness on the bottom. Uh, and you'll notice that the way that the serpent player was playing was he was actually playing so that the bottom end of the serpent was facing out so that the sound was coming not only through the finger holes but also through the bottom of the instrument towards the conductor. Here, here are the uh, kind of an outline of the family of ophiclides. So from left to right, you have the alto, uh, soprano, tenor, and then there are two base, base uh, ophiclides here, the two center ones, B flat and C, and then the contrabass. And they all have the same amount of keys. It's just the length of tubing that changes in order to change the overall pitch. Now, the Ophicline on the right uh, is an early rendition uh, of an Ophicline that is a combination of wood and metal. That patent lasted for a very short period of time because the amount of moisture that would end up sitting in these instruments, it would warp the wood really quickly. So then they, they quickly switched over to metal um, entirely. And that metal does vary from instrument to instrument, um, the most common being brass, hence the, the you know, hence brass instruments. <laughs> um, the next member of the family is uh, 
not a very well-known instrument um, is the sax horn. Now we've kind of met ourselves halfway in between uh, uh, where Adolf sax and the French makers kind of come together. So this instrument is it's argued over a lot what came first, whether or not it was truly was the sax horn or if it was the tuba. And um, but the earliest records are that Adolf Sax created this instrument based off of the Ophiclide. And in the early 1800s, around 1818, uh, piston valves were created so that it allowed the instruments to be really versatile, but also accurate. Uh, whereas before with the paddles, it didn't allow for the, the notes to pop out as much, to pop out as easily. And so it just, with the invention of the piston valve around the same time, it really allowed more instruments to come into production. So the sax horn is technically a member of the tuba family due to the fact that, now I haven't mentioned this before, these instruments, what makes something part of the tuba family is that it's conical in nature. So overall, from the start of where the mouth, let me grab this, I'll show you this horn in a minute, but from where the mouthpiece enters the instrument, all the way until where the bell is attached, which you'll see a brace here, the instrument is continuously getting larger. So as does a cone. So from the start of the cone to the end of the cone, uh, that's what signifies that something is of the tuba family is if it has, if it is conical in nature, as opposed to being a cylindrical, uh, being cylindrical in shape like the trombone and trumpet. So these instruments have all of that in common. Same thing with the serpent. So the serpent is actually the easiest one to see that from the time that the mouthpiece enters the instrument, it continuously gets larger or wider, um, as does this sax horn. I, I personally think that um, the sax horn uh, has the most similar quality of sound as the euphonium does, but it has just a little bit more of the brightness that earlier instruments of that time were known to have. Since they were technically tuning at a different uh, frequency, so they all tend to play a little high. Um, a sax horn, it can have as many, as you can see in this picture, as five valves, though um, it oftentimes, oftentimes only has four plus of what is common in the, in the tuba world is a tuning trigger. So the lower we get in our harmonic series, in our instruments, and I know that Dr. Bassler talked to you guys about the harmonic series. It works the same for our instrument or the overtone series. It works the same for our instrument. We just start lower. Now, the lower you get in that series, the squirrelier the notes are. So the less stable. As, and the same thing goes for it. The higher you get when you're in the extreme registers, it becomes less stable. So what this extra valve on this instrument does is it allows for a greater number of finger combinations so that you have uh, more ac or greater access to difficult notes. Um, and so that's kind of what Adolf's vision was, was this, of this instrument was to be a virtuosic instrument, but that was able to keep up with the uh, ever-growing popular cornets and, and trumpets of the time. Uh, again, this is part of the, we are all part of the bugle family being brass instruments. This is just a 19th century version of it. Um, unlike past family members, this instrument does not have as wide of a subgroup. Um, the most common are the tenor and bass sax horn. Um, and that was just, again, where the voices sat. We didn't need alto sax horns because we had t cornets and we 
when this came out, the tuba was also kind of coming out, so we had bass, the bass voices, so it just needed to sit somewhere in the middle. Now, if you are familiar with uh, images or um, the reenactments of Civil War bands or even just the kind of the, the re reenactments of the wars, you'll notice that a lot of the instruments of that time were actually facing backwards, and those are actually sax horns. Those were the sax horn, the, that's, that's what this is here. This one's just facing straight up because it, it's, a, it's a more modern version of it. But all the instruments that you s would see completely going backwards or off to the left were all sax horns or part of the sax horn family. Now I have, you were, I hope you love this, whoops. I hope you love this because I cannot get enough of this, but there is a French sax horn quartet because uh, sax horn you can actually still major in this in Paris <laughs> um, and it it's uh, a, a sax horn quartet that they explore various genres of music so this is what four sax horns will sound like enough of that one. I hope you liked it. I saw some smiles, so I'm so glad. <laughs> it's a, uh, so this is kind of the moment, again, like I mentioned earlier, this is the, the midway point where Adolf Sachs breaks off and is now inventing the saxophone. So you'll hear there are a lot of similarities between euphonium and saxophone, and this is one of them. The, the amount of notes that they were playing at the time far surpasses the amount of notes that trombones and trumpets at the time were playing. So this is where the modern instruments start to take off. Um, oops, I didn't mean to close it up. Let me get here. So here are <laughs> some sax horns. Now you may see the one on the left looks like something out of Dr. Seuss. Uh, and oddly enough, Dr. Seuss was actually inspired by the sax horn to create some of the instruments that he did. Uh, so these are true instruments that have at one point been played. Um, and, uh, you know, I, understandably so, uh, dropped, uh, they kind of dropped off the map because they weren't, it wasn't even feasible to carry these instruments around because they were so heavy due to all the bells. But, um, Typically, when you see these instruments, uh, the each valve controls one of the bells. So that's you know, and I'm just now realizing that I meant to put a picture in here of a double bell euphonium. I'll have to I'll have to upload it onto here and then I'll send it off to you, Don. Okay, so I'm I'm I'll make sure I get that in. But so this is where multiple, this is the point in history where multiple bells were starting to be added, and that was to give different effects. So th they would change the size of the bells uh, to, to help facilitate different sounds. Um, and you can see on the bottom, bottom right, the bell facing backwards. Um, 
this was just an easier way to help facilitate uh, the where the sound was going so they would actually play past an event and start playing once they've already passed it so that they would hear everything and then around this time during john philip souza is when they started pointing the bells forward <laughs> so that they could come at the event instead of walk march past the event and allow for the sound to trail behind them um so that's kind of where we transition from either the bells facing off to the left or off to the back to now everything facing forward. Okay, so now we're on to the tuba, um, which literally translates to tube because we are not a fancy bunch. So uh, I picked this recording because to a lot of people um, don't necessarily correlate tuba with playing beautiful music, but I hope you absolutely love this. <laughs> So that is your introduction into the lovely tuba sound. Now here's a fun fact for you. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the first Friday of May is always International Tuba Day. So it's, it's customary to hug a tuba player on that day <laughs> and to play polkas, but <laughs> that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, all of these, now I know the picture's blurry and I apologize for that, I don't know what happened. All of these are different tubas. Uh, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the, the, the conversation, uh, tubas in general are the most diverse when it comes to how they are shaped and how they look. So as you can see in this picture here, there's only one tuba that has valves that are facing forward and the rest of them they're facing upwards um it's just a different form um, you'll also notice that there are two different types of valves tubas like some french horns they actually have paddles or rotary valves and then the majority of our instruments 
pistons. Um, and that's just at the preference of the performer. They do have uh, certain characteristics of sound with each valve set, but overall, they, they all do the same thing. One's, they're just different preferences. So the tuba is, in fact, the lowest pitched member of the brass family. Now, with that being said, there are technically four different subgroups of tubas, and they are pitched in different keys. We have our bass tubas, which are E flat and F, and we have our contrabass tubas, which are C and B flat. The bass tubas technically are, well, are typically more seen as the solo tubas, whereas the contrabass tubas are primarily used in concert bands or, most importantly, orchestras. That's what gives the, the contrabass tubas are the ones that you will typically see with those just uh, kind of like an umbrella of sound that just kind of uh, wafts over an orchestra. Uh, so around 1835. Now, again, the dates are kind of skewed here because uh, when they filed for the patent. Uh, the tuba was starting to be developed in 1835. Now, by this point, the valves have been around for quite a, a, a number of years, so they kind of worked a lot of the kinks out of the valves, so it allowed for the the production of tubas to happen very quickly and by a vast array of, of companies. Um, the overall size, if you were to stretch out a tuba, does tend to be in a range of 12 to 18 feet. Now, the bass tubas tend to be closer to 12 feet and the contrabass tubas are closer to 18 feet. That's what gives them that distinct uh, that tone and that richness of sound down in the low range. And the, uh, the metal that is used, it, it's, it varies from tuba to tuba. So uh, you'll see actually mine here. This is a bass tuba. This is an E flat tuba. The underneath this, the lacquer coat, which is what you see, is actually just brass. Um, I do have stainless steel in my horn as well, which allows for less um, less change due to temperature, which is really nice. Um, but this this instrument is a, a a typical size, meaning that it is of standard quarter four quarter size. Um, our instruments do come in again not only different shapes and different what we call wraps is how tightly or loose the instruments are wrapped but it also has different sizes so this is a four quarter we have a three quarter for smaller people a five quarter and a six quarter which are just monster tubas and tubas as small as this one even equal a, a range about 30 pounds um which is it can be a lot when you're carrying multiple tubas around. Uh, I'm gonna play for you a little bit of something, so I hope you recognize this. Uh, this is what a bass tuba will typically sound like. Um, I was a goof and I forgot my contrabass at home because I just have too many instruments here, but, but here is the lovely bass tuba. Oh, let me turn my volume down a little bit. Oh, actually, that's no, okay. Typical 
tuba will sound like. Um, the the only difference that when when you're starting to play a contrabass, you'll have more of this richer. deeper sound, which will sound even, even more resonant on a larger tuba. Okay, so I, I compiled some tuba fun facts. I, I'm just realizing the time, so I'm going to speed through these so we have time for questions. Uh, so from polkas, jazz, tuba Christmas to brass band, the tuba is the absolute foundation of the sound. So with that in mind, we have a lot of the instrument has a lot of responsibility with not as many notes, to be honest, as the other brass instruments, but it has an extreme responsibility to stay completely stationary and to not waver in sound. Um, that being said, the tuba has one of the widest usable ranges at a whopping six octaves, which is crazy because a trumpet has two and a half, typically. So it just, it completely surpasses that of its ancestors, all due to the fact that we have a lot of history behind the brass instruments to really help the tubas kind of come to fruition. Um, regardless of the sounding pitch, like I said, this tuba is pitched in E flat. Uh, they are concert pitch instruments. So an E flat is an E flat. We merely, as, as tuba players, we just learn different sets of fingerings for each tuba. So that's just kind of how we, we function around it. We just, we learn ways of, of memorizing new fingerings. Uh, another fun fact for you. So tuba players hold a Guinness Book of World Records, uh, hold a record in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest tuba ensemble, which was at, at Times Square with a 502 tubas, which is crazy because it's loud when there are only 13 tubas together. <laughs> I can only imagine how many, how it would sound with 502. Uh, we have various chamber ensembles, uh, as well as large ensembles, as well as jazz bands and marching bands that the tubas take um, part in. Now I can't don't want to spend too much time on this one. You guys just need to hear this. This is this is going to be way different from anything else I've shown you. But not only do tuba players play with other people, but they also play with themselves. So here you go. going to be nothing like what I, <laughs> what I showed you before. Um, that is just kind of a taste of what a tuba can do. And I only have a couple more slides left. I'm going to try to rush through them really quick. Round of the euphonium, which translates to sweet sounding or sweet voiced. Um, this is the modern day tenor tuba. So it took the place of where this, uh, the sax horn, ophicleide, and the serpent kind of placed. Here is a beautiful recording of Piazzolla by a friend of mine, uh, a Norwegian euphonium player that 
it's just very simple, but it's 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 quite beautiful. And we'll just listen to a few seconds of it. <laughs> that's just a quick clip of that um all of these links are in the uh document so please if if, if you're interested uh so the euphonium it's hard to decide again when it was created or developed because uh, at the time there were instruments being made between 1838 and 1843. However, the modern day instrument, which is, uh, oh, it's way over here. Hold on. <laughs> the modern day instrument has a greater set of valves or I mean tubes, especially in the back. So what you see today was, wasn't actually established until the late 1800s, around 1874, when the compensating system had been developed. Um, the compensating system just allows for the instrument to fully reach down into its low register all the way down. So way down into the tuba register and then way up past the trumpet or into the trumpet register. Um, so it allows for the versatility of those. Uh, and like the trombone, the ophoclide, and the serpent, if I were to stretch this instrument out, it would be a full eight feet. Um, and now, uh, in current production, they are made with various metals. Mine happens to be silver, um, but it has brass underneath it, as well as uh, stainless steel on the inside. Um, but again, each instrument does vary. You'll have rose gold. You'll have, um, you'll actually have instruments made entirely out of gold. Uh, it's just a preference for the players. Um, the modern day euphonium is, ex is the, one of the most virtuosic members of the brass family. Um, and it is due by and large to the fact that there have been so many predecessors that this is just a more refined version uh, of brass instruments that they've kind of worked their kinks out. Um, they're very common in military bands from as early as the 1870s to today, and it's utilized in a wide array of ensembles. Um, oh, I don't know why it's not working. But that's here is the uh, kind of the culmination of this. Uh, it goes into baritone horns as well. Um, and I'm so sorry, I, I've gone over in time. The one downside to these instruments are, of course, the price point. <laughs> You'll see here that they do range in price and they are quite drastic. So um, that, is, that is the downside. Now, I had to get to this last slide because I did this specifically for you guys. <laughs> so, so that is the presentation of the tuba um and again tubas are the answer so i i'm pretty sure i answered all your questions <laughs> just kidding i will stop sharing my screen and please let me know if you have any questions that's fantastic danielle thank you for this wonderful presentation <laughs> I think there will be a lot of, of questions. I can see some hands up. I'd like to uh, exercise the whole privilege, if I may, and ask two rather technical questions. You talk a lot about vowels. Can you tell us, in a nutshell, what a vowel does? Yeah. So let me grab. OK. So let me angle my camera down just a little bit. I'm going to unscrew one of my valves so you can see. So essentially what the valve does is you'll see all these tubes that are coming off of the valves. 
each one of these tubes corresponds with a hole in the valve. So if you see here, each valve has a set of holes and all of those holes co correspond with a set of tubing. Now when compressed, that's when this, the air is allowed to come through and thus producing a pitch, uh, a pitch associated with the valves being pushed. Now, if, hold on one second. So if I were to play a note and then slowly compress my valves, you'll hear where the pitch kind of doesn't allow for a full sound to come through. That's actually called half valving and we'll do that and we can noodle around our instrument with them half compressed, but the valve just allows for ports of air, airflow essentially. Very good, thanks. One other question, I've always thought the euphonium was sound is one of the most beautiful of all the instruments actually. And it's played, especially when it's played with vibrato. How do you get a vibrato on a brass instrument with a mouthpiece like this? So there are different versions of vibrato. Uh, a lot of times people will actually use what's called jaw vibrato. And what they'll do is they'll, once they are in their mouthpiece, they'll actually change the space in between their mouth with their jaw, like this. And so I'm changing the overall oral shape in my mouth. You can do it when you're whistling too, but there are also other versions like air and then uh, lip vibrato. So you're gonna do the same motion, but with a lip. So not so wide with the jaw. And then with air, you're actually bending the pitch slightly. Really all that vibrato is, is going in and out of pitch or out of tune. So with lip, it's a little more subtle. And it doesn't seem so jarring as the jaw. Very good. Now let's open it up. If you will have a question, please raise your hand and Julianne will coordinate that. Awesome. I see a lot of people unmuting. If you don't mind, stay muted until we call on you for your question, just because of the background noise. Um, David Polliger, you were up first. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Danielle. Yeah. Would you yeah. say a word about the sousaphone? Oh, yes. Okay, so the sousaphone came around uh shoot what time i don't remember the exact year but so essentially what was happening is all these sax horns were going backwards and then they developed what's called a helican which would they took a tuba and they wrapped it around the body and it went this way which again was not serving any purpose for sound going forward it was just going up and they what they called them were rain catchers because the bells were pa facing straight up and rain would just fall on them as they were marching and they would slowly fill up. And so these, you know, these 30 pound instruments would now become 50 pound instruments and, and you couldn't get any sound out of them. So then they, John Philip Sousa actually created a patent for the sousaphone so that you could record with it. So they call, it's, it's a family, it's an offshoot called uh, recording bell instruments. So they would actually, you'd actually be able to install them into your instrument so that they, you could point the bell wherever the microphone was. So this bell, you could have it pointing backwards if you wanted. If the microphone was back there, you could have it just pointing backwards. Um, but yeah, so they, they created it for marching, of course, but also for recording purposes because even today, our modern tubas, they go straight up but we don't use them for marching. So it, it, uh, it was definitely utilized that way. Thank you. I have a question. I see you, Walter Wynn. I have a question from chat. It says, what was the piece you played on the bass tuba? Oh, <laughs> so it's called, it's a, it's a little German lullaby. It's called German song. And it was just, it's, it's kind of a, a song that like you'll get sung when you're, younger. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Walter Wynn, go ahead. Unmute. I wondered when you have the marching bands and the very heavy instruments, do they have a uh, 
like a saxophone does with a cord around your neck to help support the instrument? Sadly, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wish. Um, no, they, you know, the way that they're taught in marching band, whenever you have to play those instruments, they actually will hang weights on the end of their bell while they're practicing so that it's heavier than it actually is. So during practice, they'll hold it up and it is 30 pounds there. And then the euphoniums, they're, they're about, uh, they're about 15 to 20 pounds, but they'll hold them straight out and they'll put extra weight on them so that you're constantly gaining muscle. So by the time that they have to perform, it's, it, you know, <laughs> now that being said, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> it's so heavy. <laughs> I'd rather just sit and play the tuba. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Richard Petway, go ahead. Uh, it's time for a silly question. <laughs> so, uh, what I know about the tuba is dotting the I in Ohio <laughs> State Stadium. Oh, no. And I want to talk about the uh, band member chosen that illustrious honor of dotting the I in Ohio um, in the stadium. And I guess uh, what are their what is their future? Do they uh, do they go from this exalted height of donning the tuba into a concert, or do they go into a marching band? What is the future of of this exalted person who dotted the eye? Gosh, you know, I I think probably into a concert setting. To be honest. Um, since gosh yeah I, I i would i would almost imagine it's funny because a lot of the people that get chosen for that position to dot the i ironically they don't go on for with music at all <laughs> which is crazy to think about because it's they're going to insurance yeah yeah they 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 rarely stay in music if if had been in music prior at all it's yeah it's crazy Thank you. Mm -hmm. Izzy, go ahead. Well, David already mentioned the sousaphone. When I was in the uh, ninth grade, uh, I decided I want to play the drums, but the bandmaster said all he had was a tuba, but it turned out it was a sousaphone. But when you carried it in the parade, you did wear it around your neck, so it wasn't so difficult to carry. Yeah. But it was heavy, and I, that's the only reason I did it for one year. Yeah, I, uh, so they actually, nowadays they use fiberglass sousaphones, but when they first created the sousaphone, it was completely made out of metal, and it was about 50 pounds. And they actually, now they uh, created, or they designed these, sousaphone pads that would go on your shoulder and wrapped in in the around the sousaphone itself but it's still i mean i remember marching with a sousaphone and i would get uh massive uh knots that just pile on top of one another and and then that becomes what they they call it a sousaphone callus which does not sound lovely at all but but you know it, it does help with the pain a little bit <laughs> but no it's yeah tuba is not for the faint of heart i don't think <laughs> other question see david david go ahead again so, near the back row of the orchestra you see a lineup of a tuba the trombones and the french horns but you never see a euphonium oh it hurts my heart there are very few pieces written for orchestra. Esta I should say, there are very few established pieces written for orchestra that include the euphonium. And to my knowledge, it is a mere, it, it's a lot of times people that actually conduct orchestras have very little knowledge of the euphonium. So people even today won't write a euphonium in because their music won't get played 
because the conductor doesn't necessarily right. know how or where the euphonium fits in. Um, now, my personal opinion, the euphonium is an awesome bridge between the French horns and the tubas because like French horns, tubas and euphoniums are both conical. A lot of times the trombone, the bass trombone is kind of smushed in there to kind of be that bridge, but it doesn't allow for the sound to kind of endlessly flow from one instrument to the other. Um, that's kind of what the euphonium does, does have a nice role there. And now what is a Wagnerian tuba? So a Wagnerian tuba is more in the horn family. Um, it actually, so let me grab, so I brought this out. I just didn't have time to get to it. This is called a trombonium, right? And uh, yeah, and it has a recording bell. See, there's actually a screw here that I can screw it off, but I just want you to use this as an, uh, to use your imagination. So the Wagner tuba actually had, it comes around like this. So if I were to move my bell, which it's stuck right now, oh. If I were to move it like this and then play it with my valves up front, but it's a rotor valve, that is a Wagner tuba and it's pitched in F, I believe, um, but they are not concert pitch instruments. So that means that you have to transpose while you're playing it, um, but it is more in, the, in, again, it's an attempt to create a color uh, flow between tubas and and uh, French horns, and it creates a really nice uh, punchy sound um, that sometimes the horns can't necessarily do really quickly. That only Wagner exploited. <laughs> he created <Right>. these <laughs> for his own, you know, yeah, for his own uh, sound sound collection, I guess. <laughs> Very good. Other questions, please? Go ahead, Jim Wilshire. Unmute. Thank you very much for a wonderful description of all this, these horns. Oh, uh, you. you mentioned, it seemed to me that the trombone and, and the trumpet and all those can move the notes pretty quickly, but you said euphonium was designed to change notes very rapidly. Yeah. Can you tell us what and why and give us cite an example of a music that, that where it's used? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the reason that I'm looking for my horn, <laughs> the reason that this instrument was it kind of takes on that role as being really virtuosic. And so the euphonium sits right where the human voice sits. It kind of stays in that area. So oddly enough, we're able to hear it really easily. So with that in mind, it's with everything that we do as musicians, we do a lot of kind of voicing things here in our mouth that allow us to replicate it on the instrument. So with modern, modern uh, kind of development into the instrument, our valves are extremely fast, much faster and more agile than uh, tuba valves, to be honest. <laughs> but also, but also like French horn and the uh, and the the biggest downfall for biggest downfall, I guess, and uh, positive of trombone is the fact that it has a slide, so it can do those things. But we take that tenor voice and then we we exploit the fact that we have valves. Um, here's a little something. Let me grab my iPad really quick. I'll play a little something for you. It's called Cascades. I just need to pull it up. <laughs> Hold on one second. Hang on. All right. Hang on one second. Pulling up the music really quick. I don't know what's going on, but everything's freaking out on my iPad. All right, hold on one second. I'm going to grab the music. Uh, 
and she's your cutest presenter yet. I love her enthusiasm. Uh -huh. I'm surprised she could watch the crawl across the floor with all those instruments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is Alan Vizzuti's Cascades. I'm going to play a little snippet of it. And let me turn my volume down just a little bit because I think I'll peak. Danielle, what led you to decide to play the tuba? Um, so I actually didn't play the tuba until college. So I started university as a genetics and microbiology major. And I did that for like three years. Now this whole time I was in marching band and I really loved being in marching band. I love the camaraderie. Uh, I just, I thought it was exactly where I needed to be. So I, I talked to the professor and he set me up with lessons with one of his students and I did all of that and I initially learned euphonium. And um, so this was junior year of college. And so I added a few more years onto my degree so I would finish the music degree. Uh, and I didn't learn tuba until my master's degree. And I, it was probably the best life decision I've, I've ever made. You know, and at first I was terrified because going from something that I, I could see myself, I knew exactly where I would go job-wise to something that was a little bit more <laughs> uh, cloudy. <laughs> well, speaking personally, I think for all of us, we're glad you made that choice. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And we're delighted that you're taking time from your busy and rather hectic teaching situation over there to share your, your many talents with us. Everyone yes. Thank you. Daniel, okay? Thank you so much. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Next week, we'll be back same time, same place, uh, to meet the members of the Trumpet family. So, see you next week. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for coming. Good to see everyone. Stay well. <laughs>